tonight. Chaos at the consulate. Israel changes aim towards Iran as Syria's Iranian embassy suffers heavy attacks, rendering many dead. BB go home. Israelis gather in solidarity with those affected in the Gaza conflict, demanding the government to bring action to their pledges. Sentence suspended. Pakistan's Imran Khan sees his appeal go through, having both his and his wife's 14-year sentences dropped conveniently following the election season. And medical marvels. The operating room sees a live concert in the midst of a miraculous procedure. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for taking the time to join us on World News this Tuesday evening. With the dawn of this April, we hope to continue to bring you key stories and updates from across the globe. Well, we have a number of developments to bring to your attention tonight, starting off with Israeli-Iran tensions. Iran says Israel has bombed its embassy in Syria, killing a top commander. While Israel has not yet claimed responsibility for the bombing, Tehran says that it preserves the right to respond to the consulate attack. Emergency workers scaled rubble inside Iran's embassy compound in Syria after a suspected bombing by Israeli warplanes on Monday. Tehran said the strike killed seven military advisors, including three senior commanders. The target, according to Iranian state media, was top Revolutionary Guards commander Mohammad Reza Zahedi. He had been a senior commander in Iran's elite Quds force, the Corps' overseas arm, according to the guards. Iran's ambassador to Syria, Hossein Akbari, said Tehran's response would be harsh. Syria's foreign minister condemned the attack. Its state media cited a military source saying Israel launched the attack from the occupied Golan Heights and that its air defense system shot down some of the missiles. The strike appeared to signal an escalation in Israel's war against Iran's regional proxies. Israel has long targeted Iranian military installations in Syria, as well as the proxies. Monday's attack marked the first time Iran's embassy compound itself had been hit. Since the attack on Israel nearly six months ago by Palestinian group Hamas, which is also backed by Iran, Israel has ramped up strikes in Syria against Iran's guards, as well as Hezbollah, the Tehran-backed Lebanese armed group. They both support Syria's government of President Bashar al-Assad. The White House said it was still looking into reports about the strikes, while State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller said the goal is still to prevent any possible escalation of conflict. But of course, we are always uh, concerned about, um, uh, about anything that would be escalatory or um, cause an increase in conflict in the region. Israel typically does not comment on its attacks in Syria and declined to do so on Monday, although it also said on Monday it had stopped weapons from being smuggled into the West Bank from Iran. Meanwhile, a sudden tragedy has struck in the West Bank as foreign nationals were among seven aid workers killed in an Israeli military strike as they were delivering food to starving civilians in Gaza. Several employees of the World Central Kitchen nonprofit were killed in an Israeli airstrike on Gaza. That's according to the NGO, who said those killed included citizens of Poland, Australia, Britain, a dual citizen of the United States and Canada, as well as several Palestinians. Video obtained showed paramedics moving bodies into a hospital in central Gaza and displaying the passports of three of those killed. The NGO said the workers were traveling in two armored cars marked with the WCK logo and another vehicle, and that despite coordinating movements with the Israeli Defense Force, the convoy was hit as it was leaving a warehouse used to store food aid brought to Gaza by sea. The chief executive of WCK called the attack, quote, unforgivable. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese on Tuesday confirmed the death of Australian A-worker Lalzami Zomi Francom. WCK delivers food relief and prepares meals for people in need. It said last month it had served more than 42 million meals in Gaza over 175 days. Chef Jose Andres, who started the NGO in 2010, said on X, 
The Israeli government needs to stop this indiscriminate killing. It needs to stop restricting humanitarian aid, stop killing civilians and aid workers, and stop using food as a weapon. Commenting on the reports, the Israeli military said it was conducting a thorough review at the highest levels of what it called a tragic incident and said that it makes, quote, extensive efforts to enable aid to reach the people of Gaza. WCK said it was pausing its operations in the region immediately and would make decisions soon about the future of its work. And Israel now, thousands of Israelis gathered outside the parliament building in Jerusalem in the largest anti-government demonstration since the country went to war in October. They urged the government to reach a deal to free dozens of hostages held by Hamas in Gaza and to hold early elections. Nearly six months into the war, Israeli protesters have lost patience with their prime minister. They're camping out in front of the Knesset for four days after taking to the streets on Sunday in the largest anti-government protest since the start of the conflict. After putting up a united front following October 7th, cracks in Israeli society are re-emerging. Benjamin Netanyahu has not delivered on his promises of destroying Hamas and bringing all the hostages home. Some 100 Israelis and the remains of 30 others are believed to still be detained. Many hostages' families had refrained from publicly denouncing the Prime Minister and the attacks aftermath, but now believe time is running out and are calling for a ceasefire. Netanyahu is also facing a series of corruption charges which are slowly making their way through the courts, and protesters say his decisions appear to be focused on political survival over the national interest. Unless his government falls apart sooner, Netanyahu won't face elections until spring of 2026. And over on the Ukraine-Russia conflict, the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky marked the second anniversary of the recapture of the Kyiv region from invading Russian forces. For more on this story, we have other than the world news special correspondent Shanika Dharmaratna from Vietbesk in Belarus. Shanika? Yes, Anuradhi. Speaking in front of local residents and top officials at a memorial in Butcher, Zelensky held a minute of silence for people killed by Russian forces near the capital two years ago. The Ukrainian military recaptured the small towns of Irpin and Butcher outside Kyiv in late March 2022. Ukraine says Russian troops committed large-scale atrocities in Butcher, Irpin and other places in the Kyiv region after their military retreat revealed ravaged streets littered with civilian bodies. Ukrainian authorities put the civilian death toll in the areas of the Kyiv region liberated from Russian forces at 1,137, including 461 killed in Butcher alone. Russia denies the allegations. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the world news special correspondent Shana Kudamaratna from Vietpesk in Belarus. Over in our region now, a Pakistani court has granted former PM Imran Khan an appeal of his conviction for graft, while also suspending a 14-year jail sentence handed down both to him and his wife just a week before the February elections. A Pakistani court has granted former Prime Minister Imran Khan an appeal of his conviction for graft, his lawyer said on Monday. The decision suspends a 14-year jail sentence handed down to both him and his wife just a week before February's elections on charges of unlawfully selling state gifts worth more than $500,000. The Islamabad High Court said a final decision on the conviction will be taken up for arguments and evidence as a main petition after Eid holidays. Khan, however, will remain in jail on multiple other sentences also imposed before the elections. Those disqualify him from holding any public office for 10 years. Still, the decision brings relief for Khan's embattled party, which won the most seats in February's national polls. The ex-cricket star's lawyer Ali Zafar told supporters they were now working on other cases. Tomorrow, we will be trying to get a suspension in the Disclosing State Secrets case also. If that is suspended, as I said earlier, after that, there will be no hurdle to Imran Khan's release from prison. 
Khan and his party say the charges are made up to keep him out of politics, ordered by the country's powerful army after he fell out with the military's generals. The army denies the accusation. In our neighbouring India now, Indian opposition parties united to protest against the arrest of a prominent leader weeks before national election, accusing Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his party of rigging the vote and harassing them with large tax demands. A major show of strength by India's opposition to protest what they say is an erosion of democracy. Speaking to a crowd of thousands, opposition leaders accused Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government of arresting and stifling opponents. You cannot suppress the voice of India. No one can suppress this voice. There is no power in the world that can suppress this voice. Among those arrested is Chief Minister of Delhi, Arvind Kejriwal. A staunch Modi critic, Kejriwal is an anti-corruption crusader and a high-profile leader of an opposition alliance. The 55-year-old was jailed earlier in March on bribe charges, causing a major setback for the alliance that wants to challenge Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party in upcoming elections. Nearly a billion Indians will vote to elect a new government in the six-week general election starting on April 19th. According to opinion polls, incumbent Modi is widely expected to win a third straight term, partly due to the resonance of his Hindu nationalist politics with members of the country's majority faith. Let's go for a short commercial break. More key global stories right after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We have an update on the Baltimore Bridge collapse now. Trapped vessels have started to escape Baltimore port following last week's collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. A channel has been opened on the northbound side of the fallen crossing. That's allowing limited marine traffic to pass through. The first vessel was a tug pushing a barge full of jet fuel for the Department of Defense. However, much of the channel remains blocked by wreckage and the giant container ship Dolly, which struck the bridge and brought it down. That means it could be a long time before commercial shipping can get back to normal at the port, a key gateway for exports of farm goods and other products. Maryland Governor Wes Moore says no effort will be spared to restore the crossing and restart cargo movement. Efforts are underway to remove the wreckage, but it's no easy task. Officials say it's so tangled that it's hard to know where to cut. Recovery workers needed 10 hours to free and remove one 200-ton piece of debris. And they described that as a relatively small lift. The Coast Guard says the situation is even worse underwater, where visibility is limited by the sheer volume of debris. That all leaves officials unwilling to estimate how long the clear-up could take. On Friday, U.S. President Joe Biden will get a first-hand look at the problem when he visits the area. The administration is working with Congress to ensure that the federal government pays to rebuild the bridge. And on the road to the White House tonight in a new campaign ad, former President Donald Trump doubled down on his promise to crack down on immigration. The ad, which was set to horror music, portrayed thousands of migrants from various countries entering the U.S. This comes as Trump plans to visit Michigan after a Grand Rapids woman was allegedly killed by an undocumented immigrant. Venezuela! Tonight, former President Trump doubling down on a 2024 campaign flashpoint, immigration. Millions of illegal border crossers have entered the country unlawfully. In a recent post, Trump sharing a new campaign video set to horror music, showing thousands of migrants said to be traveling to the U.S. from many countries. Trump promising in the ad to crack down. We will secure our borders and we will restore our sovereignty. It comes as Trump prepares to visit Michigan Tuesday in the wake of the death of a Grand Rapids woman, Ruby Garcia, allegedly at the hands of an undocumented immigrant who police say was in a romantic relationship with her. 
Authorities say he'd been previously deported during the Trump administration. This is a horrible incident with Ruby. What what a horrible thing. We had a tough policy of getting the bad ones out, and we were getting the bad ones out, and now the bad ones are coming in at a level that nobody's ever seen before. Trump has made his hardline stance on immigration and migrants a hallmark of his political image. When Mexico sends its people, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. But in recent months, Trump has escalated his rhetoric on immigration. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. President Biden has tried to turn the tables on Trump, blasting him for ordering congressional Republicans to kill a bipartisan border bill. I'm told my predecessor called members of Congress in the Senate to demand they block the bill. He feels political win. He viewed it as a, would be a political win for me and a political loser for him. But new polling shows Americans, and even some Democrats, are siding with Trump on the issue. A new survey shows 68 percent of Americans disapprove of President Biden's handling of the border, including four in ten Democrats. That includes more than half of black adults and nearly three quarters of Hispanics. And while nearly half of U.S. adults hold President Biden responsible for America's border problems, only 35 percent say the same about former President Trump. The Biden campaign now forced to reckon with a decades-old wedge issue as the 2024 race rests on a razor's edge. We have more election-related updates now. With talks of a general election in the UK picking up, citizens still remain somewhat unconvinced on who to support. Polls showing that Rishi Sunak's seat may well be at risk this time. And for updates on the ground, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandadasa, this time from Chesham in the UK. Rasita, how have you been finding the consensus over in the UK? Hi, Anradi. The UK election is expected to happen somewhere this year. And most of the pundits and even the general public believes that the Labour would have a victory this time. But a few days ago, there was a Sunday Times opinion poll which shows that the Labour are going to have a massive victory over the ruling Conservative Party, which came as a shocker for pretty much everyone. It actually showed that the Conservative would have less than 100 seats, 98 precisely, and Labour would have a landslide of over 400 seats. And Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister himself, will struggle to win his own seat. So this pretty much shows that the, even the public opinions and the general feeling is that the Labour might form the next government. But wait a minute. Would it be that easy? No, there is a problem. It has nothing to do with the UK. It's a Gaza problem. 30 to 40 seats around in the uh, in, in UK have a 30 to 50 percent Muslim percentage. And most of the Muslim people living here are not happy with the Labour stance uh, on the Gaza issue. And the recent by-election victory by the George Galloway, where he comprehensively defeated both conservatives and the Labour shows that the election victory is not a straightforward one for the Labour's. <clears throat> so when the elections and the whole UK economic policy relies on that, people are expecting uh, the Labour to have a win but not an easy one and the George Galloway to do something which no one expect. Over to you Anwadi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Rasatha Chandradasa from Chesham in the UK. And on the doctor walkouts now, South Korean President Yoon suk yeol said his government is open to talks with doctors who oppose his plan to increase medical school admissions, while accusing critics of offering no reasonable alternative to ease a doctor shortage. South Korea's president on Monday opened the door to talks with the country's thousands of protesting trainee doctors who are upset with his plan to increase medical school admissions. It's the first time Yoon suk yeol has signaled his willingness to seek a compromise on his health care reform proposals as the country faces a worsening shortage of medical personnel. In a 50-minute address, Yoon apologized for the inconvenience caused by the doctors who walked out of their jobs en masse weeks ago. But he also accused the medical sector of putting their own interests ahead of public health and hit out at critics for not offering any better options to ease the doctor shortage. If they want to argue that the scale of the increase should be reduced, they should propose a unified idea with solid scientific evidence rather than taking collective action. 
If you come up with a more proper and reasonable solution, we can discuss it as much as you want. More than 90% of the country's 13,000 trainee doctors have been staging walkouts since February the 20th in protest of Yoon's plan to boost medical school admissions by 2,000 students starting next year. They want the government to review their pay and work conditions first. Many senior doctors, including medical professors, have also voiced support for the young physicians. Some medical professionals have said Yoon's administration had failed to consult in advance and that his plan would do little to fix the ongoing problems young doctors face. On Monday, Yoon again stressed the need for more physicians in one of the most rapidly aging societies in the world. South Korea's population of 52 million had 2.6 doctors per 1,000 people in 2022, far below the average of 3.7 for developed economies. Well, in the north of the Korean peninsula now, according to South Korea's uh, military, North Korea fired a suspected intermediate-range ballistic missile into the sea off its east coast in a move that sparked immediate condemnation from the leaders of South Korea and Japan. North Korea has tested similar technology before, as seen in this state media video of a test in 2023. However, the South's military says Tuesday's launch appears to be related to a new intermediate-range hypersonic missile powered by a solid-fuel engine that was fired from Pyongyang at around 7 a.m. local time. They said the missile flew about 372 miles before plunging into the sea. Kim Jong-un oversaw a ground test of such an engine last month, as state media says was shown in this footage. Solid fuel missiles do not need to be fueled immediately ahead of launch and are often easier and safer to operate. It could make these weapons harder to detect. Tuesday's test sparked condemnation from the leaders of both the South and Japan. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol said Pyongyang will try to cause confusion as Seoul prepares for a major election later this month. Japan's leader Fumio Kishida said it disrupted the peace and stability of the region. Both countries are U.S. allies and have recently expanded military cooperation with Washington, as concerns grow that Russia is growing its own ties with Pyongyang. Officials in the United States, South Korea and Ukraine have accused North Korea of providing weapons to Russia, including missiles for use in the war in Ukraine. Pyongyang and Moscow have denied the allegations. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. With how rapid the advancement of modern medicine is, most things we hear of in the operating room might come as no surprise for us. But what are your thoughts on strumming a guitar while having your brain picked at by professionals? Sounds like something straight out of a science fiction movie. Well, it's not. Take a look. Imagine strumming chords while your brain is being operated on. That's exactly what Christian Nolan did. He told what surgery while awake felt like. It was mainly like pressure. I could feel things moving, but no pain or anything. But why was Nolan awake on the operating table? His neurosurgeons from the University of Miami Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center explain. The position of the tumor, and it is close proximity to motor functional uh, areas of the brain. That required this particular patient to remain awake for the surgery. One of the things Nolan was concerned about was his ability to continue playing guitar. We performed his surgery awake so that we could be able to remove the tumor safely and be sure that we weren't harming his hand function. Nolan was only awake for part of the two and a half hour surgery. By doing so, doctors say they were able to remove less of his bone and limit injury to the surrounding brain tissue. He's very disciplined, so it helps, and the family is very supportive, and he happens to be a, a case that we, we all love to have. Though the tumor has been completely removed, doctors say Nolan will have to undergo chemotherapy. Nolan found out about the brain tumor when his brain swelled after someone stage diving at a concert fell on him. Playing guitar may have saved his life twice. 
And finally tonight, we see a record-breaking feast. Thousands of Antwerp residents came together to combine celebrations of Muslim Iftar and Christian Easter by sharing a meal on a two-kilometer long table, breaking the record for the longest community dinner table in Belgium. The initiative promoted by the city of Antwerp together with various partners was about inclusion and connection among cultures in times of tension and polarization on a global level. The event was the second such community dinner. Last year, about 2,500 people sat down at a one-kilometer-long table, while this year the table doubled its length to host up to 7,000 people who registered to participate. Well, there's nothing better than breaking records with the power of humanity. There's no conflict that food really can't solve. Well, that's all the stories we have for you to report to you tonight on World News. I'll see you again tomorrow with more updates from across the globe. Till then, have a good night.